Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Well, we're going to begin today John's Gospel in chapter 14. And I remember when I was taking a course on this Gospel, one of the first things that we had to do was to read the entire Gospel of John in one night. And in the morning, we returned back before the professor. And he says, I want you to write down what chapter is your favorite. And the vast majority of people chose this chapter, John's Gospel and chapter 14. It is a wonderful chapter. It is a chapter that ministers to us and reveals to us great spiritual insight so that we can be changed eternally. And unless we master these words in this 14th chapter, well, if we don't, we're going to live a very frustrated life. Our faith is not going to mature, it's not going to grow, and we will not be able to perceive the things that God wants us to perceive. So let's get started. Take out your Bible, look with me, John's Gospel and chapter 14. Now, in many ways, some of the most famous verses of John's Gospel are found right here. And we want to study them anew. We want to take what we have learned about context for this Gospel and the things that Messiah reveals to give us assistance to arrive at the proper conclusions so that we can place them in our heart, that they can be seeds of change and maturity so that we can be a faithful servant of the living God. And let me tell you, if that's not your desire, then you are not going to be able to perceive what I'm going to share with you at this time. So look with me if you would to verse 1. John chapter 14, verse 1. It's a commandment. He says, do not allow your heart to be troubled. Now, it's a commandment. We make a choice. And here's the message. If we submit to what he says in these first few verses, we will not have a troubled heart. But if we don't, if we reject them, if we do not perceive what he's saying here, then our heart is going to be troubled. And we need to understand a troubled heart in two ways. Why do I say that? Well, a troubled heart has to do with someone in the fullest sense of trouble. My heart is not at peace. I feel full of anxiety. I have perhaps depression. Perhaps I'm plagued with, with wrong way of thinking, that I am constantly under temptation. I doubt, whatever it may be. That is one form of having a troubled heart. All these manifestations of things that are not pleasant. Now, there's something else. A troubled heart, remember the word heart in the Bible, has to do with thinking. So a troubled heart is a heart that doesn't think properly. And let me say something to you personally, even though that, that I don't know you from whatever. Most people are not thinking properly. And because of that, it causes their heart to be out of focus. They don't have the right mindset. And because of that, they do not grow and mature, and they do not become the useful servant of God that they could be. So once more, verse 1, he says, Do not allow your heart to be troubled. What's the solution? He says, You believe in God, also in me believe. And the emphasis here is on in me believe. And let me tell you something. If you don't believe in Yeshua, if your faith is not in Jesus of Nazareth, you have no hope in this world, and you have no opportunity to think right, and you're going to have a troubled heart. 
you are going to live out your days, whether you are wealthy or poor, whether you have success in this world or not, you're going to feel as though you're missing something. That's something you just can't get a hold of. That something's empty in your life. And whatever you do, even if you achieve your goals, it doesn't fill that, that emptiness. You don't have that, that contentment. You don't have that joy, that peace that passes understanding. So when he says here, don't let your heart be troubled. He's saying, be joyful, be content, experience peace. And in that, you won't be depressed. You won't be downcast. You won't know disappointment. Now, will you have disappointing things happen in your life? Yes, you will. But you don't have to submit to that disappointment. You can be overcomers. So once again, he says, do not allow your heart to be troubled. You believe in God, that is, you acknowledge that there's a God, acknowledge me. Also, in me, believe. And what's he saying here? He's giving us a different focus. Here's the biblical truth. My heart is troubled when the focus of my life is this world. And I focus in on what I want that I don't have things that aren't going right in my life, when I look at the problems, maybe it has nothing to do with me personally, but when I read the news and see what's going on in the world and all the suffering and all the hardship and the brutality and the crime, it just, just ruins my day. Now, here's what he wants us to realize. Unless we are kingdom focused, unless we are kingdom minded, our heart is going to be troubled. It is not an accident that he commands us, and it is in the form of the command, don't allow your heart to be troubled. You have to believe in Messiah. And in doing so, what is that going to give you? If you believe in him, what was his focus? The kingdom. And you're going to have a kingdom focus. Why do I say that? Now, verse 2. Messiah is speaking and he says, in the house of my father, there are many, and what's the word? Habitations, many rooms. Now, it troubles me that many, translation says, there are many mansions. What is that doing? That's saying, well, if you didn't get your mansion down here, you can get it in heaven. And a lot of people look to God's promises in his kingdom as simply, well, I didn't get it down here, I'll get it up there. Ridiculous. This word here is not the word mansion. It's not speaking about some estate that is very wealthy and luxurious. That's not the emphasis here. It is a place of living. It is a habitation. The old English word, it's a place of abode, a place of dwelling. That's all it is. We know nothing about this, this place, whether it's luxurious, whether it's not from that word. All it is is a place for remaining. Now, here's what I want you to see. What should be emphasized is the fact that we're going to be in the Father's house. That's what's important, that we're with Him. Think of it this way. I remember growing up that uh, not far from us was a person who was fairly well known and, and all the boys, because this guy was an athlete, all the boys wanted to, to be his friend. And, and here's the thing, they would have loved to go and slept over at his home to spend time with him, this, this great athlete that everyone would know. Now, do you think it would matter to a, a 10 year old boy where he was sleeping, he would just be so excited. I'm staying at this person's house. That's what's important. Not, well, if you invite me, what room am I going to get? Is there a color television in that room? Is the bed a king size bed? Is, they're not going to ask anything like that. They don't care if they sleep on the floor. The issue is being with him. And that's what Messiah is trying to convey to us. What we should be concerned about is not the quality of our habitation, although it's going to be wonderful, the point that should interest us is that it's his habitation, that we are going to be dwelling with him. So he says here, 
in my father's house, literally, if we read it correctly, in the house of my father, a habitation many there are. So the place here is that there's an opportunity that he wants much fellowship with people. He says, if this was not so, I would not have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. Now it uses that word place. Now the word place in the Hebrew language is hamakom, the place. And although this is the Greek word, what should come into our mind, if we look at this from a Jewish perspective, the word place is so important. I've shared with you in many Hebrew prayers, when we want to relate to God, this omnipotent God, this God who is omnipresent, and that's the key, he's everywhere. So therefore we call him Hamakom, the place, because he is located everywhere and that's why it says I prepare a place what's the point here intimacy to be with him verse 3 and if I go and prepare for you a place he says again I will come and I will take you take you to myself in order that where I am you also will be so when we read this, we can't help but see the emphasis is on this togetherness with him. That's important. That's the only thing. He says, where I am, you will be forever. So let me ask you, is this intimacy with Messiah important to you? You say, well, it's an intimacy that I can experience when I die. That's true. But not only when you die. What we're going to see is that this intimacy can be a present reality by means, and we're going to come to this in a few minutes, by means of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit leads us to do. There is an inherent relationship between the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and that believer doing ministry. Those two things go hand in hand. The Spirit functions. He's there in order to teach me truth in order that I might obey that truth. That's what the anointing is all about. It's ministry. And ministry always has someone else in mind. It goes back to what we learned a few weeks ago about that call to love one another if we're truly his disciples. So Messiah is speaking here and he says, and if I go and prepare for you a place, again I will come, and I will take you to myself, in order that where I am, you also will be. And where I go, you know. Now, he says, you should experience this. You should have understood what I'm saying. You know this, and not only you know this, but he also says, and the way you know. Once more, this phrase for knowing, whether it's speaking about this place or the way, he says it's not something that's a cognitive, it's not the word ginosko, for knowing something from a book, knowing something because of what you've been taught. No, this is a word oida, which is an experience word. And it's something that has ongoing implications because it's always in the perfect tense. So Messiah says, you know that place, you've experienced it, and you know the way. And, and notice the response of the disciples. Verse 5, Thomas, what's Thomas famous for? Doubting. So doubting Thomas, he says in verse 5, Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and if this is the case, how are we able to know the way? He says, listen, if we don't know what the objective is, we don't know the way to the objective. So Thomas is saying, Yeshua, you're wrong. We, we don't know this. Well, what's the problem? Well, the emphasis is on kingdom. And what Yeshua is saying is that he is the kingdom, intimacy with him. And he's the way into the kingdom. It's for this reason that he was sent into the world. So when Thomas doesn't get it, what Thomas is revealing, not just for him, but I believe for the disciples, generally speaking, is that they don't perceive Yeshua properly. 
they don't immediately associate him with a kingdom experience and as the one who brings them to that kingdom experience. So Thomas says to him, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and therefore how could we know the way? And Yeshua says to him, I am, in that famous verse, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, once again, we need to pay a little bit of attention at grammar. It doesn't say, I am a way, and I am a truth, and I am the life, a life. No, it's all with the definite article, the. And in this case, in the Greek language, what it's meaning is, there's only one way, and it's him. There's only one truth, and he gives it. And there's only one life, and it's through him, and it's with him. Any other is deception. Any other is not true. So in this passage of scripture, what is being taught, what is being emphasized, what is being repeated in many, many different ways and many times is that it all comes down to Yeshua. You have him, you have life. You have him, you have the way of life. If you have him, you have the truth for your life. It's all about him. So he says to, to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one is able to come to the Father. Now don't, don't miss out on this. This is an absolute statement. It is dogmatic. One cannot come to the Father. That is, you can't have any intimacy with Him. You can't be in His, His presence, that anointed presence, and experience Him without Yeshua. Now, that is why it's so problematic today when people want to say, oh, there's a broadness to the grace of God. That is a false teacher. That is someone who denies the, the uniqueness of the cross. There is not a broad aspect to the grace of God, meaning you can find that grace in a variety of ways. If you're Muslim, you find it there. If you're Buddhist, you find it there. If you're Hindu, you find it there. That is all a lie from the pit of hell. There is no salvation in any other name. There is no other way than the gospel, which is all about his death, burial, and resurrection. There is no other message of salvation. So God's grace, although it's broad in the sense that it's available to all people, God's grace is powerful because it can deal with any type of sin. But God's grace is very narrow in the fact that it is only offered through one means, and that is the blood of Messiah. And that is exactly what this scripture is emphasizing. He says here, no one is able to come to the Father except by means. That is, by means of me, on account of me, through me. However you want to translate that word dia in this, this construction, it shows that he's the only way. Now, I realize that that's not popular. People will say that is narrow-minded, that is bigotry, religious bigotry. Well, you can put whatever worldly term you want on it, but it is a fact. It's a fact that I just don't uh, think that's right, not one that I just have accepted and have called my own. It is one that I have experienced, and we're going to be talking about how we can experience and know it, not based upon some empty hope or faith that simply says, yeah, I believe that, but there's unsurety in that no. It is confirmed by the giving of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to see that in a moment. Look on to verse, verse 7. He says, uh, um, if you would have known me. Now, the construction, that, that familiar, we've talked about it before. Not the perfect, but the pluperfect. What is the pluperfect? It is to show remoteness. That is something far away. And that's why Yeshua uses it in this passage. He's talking and he says, if you would have known me, and you don't, you're really far. Also, my father you would have known, but because you're far away from knowing me, you're far away from knowing the father. Now, it's not 
knowing that there is Father God, but experiencing Him, knowing Him personally. He says it's only through Him that you can know the Father. And that's why these individuals that say, well, if there's a person that he believes in the God of Israel and he believes in the Messiah of Israel and he understands that he's sinful and the Messiah atones for sin, even if he doesn't accept that name, Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus. And let me just pause for a moment and deal with another issue because I get a lot of emails from people and they're very good questions. And one of the questions was this. Is there a superiority to the name Yeshua in, in contrast to if we say uh, Jesus? And the answer is no, there is not. I simply prefer being Jewish this name Yeshua. It is a, a name that conveys something to Jewish people. If they know a little bit of Hebrew, they know that the name Yeshua comes from the concept Yeshua, which is salvation. So he's ha Moshiach, he's the Savior. But there is nothing wrong with calling him, if you speak English, Jesus. If you speak Spanish, Jesus, whatever language it might be. Now, there are those who have a little bit of knowledge, but they will profess like they know many things. And that is, they will say, you know, in the Greek language, Jesus is Iesus. And remember that Greek God, Zeus, and therefore, really, Jesus in the Greek language, you have a pagan connection to the name of Jesus. No, you don't. That is someone who has read something but doesn't know the Greek language. Why? Because the name Jesus, that, that sus on the end, that sound is with a sigma. It's like an S. But the false god, Zeus, is with a zeta, or like a Z. So even though if we're not listening carefully, sometimes it's hard to discern the, the difference between Zeus and Zeus, but there's no connection between that false god Zeus and the name of Yeshua or Iesus. So those individuals that want to say, oh, Greek's a, a pagan language, the name Jesus comes from a pagan origin, all of that is false. It's all in order to, to build up a sense of superiority among themselves and to push others out of their little group that they want to establish. We need to understand the truth of Scripture. So in this passage of Scripture, what we find is this. He says, if you would have known me, you would know the Father. And apart from, from now, you know him. He says basically, now, from now on, that's how it should be translated, and from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Who's Yeshua speaking about? He's speaking about himself. He says, from this moment on, I want you to understand something, that you know him, and he changes it, not from that distant knowing, but an intimate knowing. He says, you know him and you see him. Why? Because they're seeing Yeshua and they know him. To know Yeshua is to know the Father. In fact, as he says, you can't know the Father, you can't experience Him without knowing Yeshua first. And again, that's why those individuals that want to, to set aside or lessen the significance of calling Yeshua by name, whether it's Jesus, Jesus, whatever you call Him in your language, that's what's important, that name. He says, look if you would to verse 8. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. So in this case, Philip misses everything. And here again, what we're seeing in the Gospel of John is how these disciples, they don't get it. You have one betraying him and the others so far removed from accepting his teachings, perceiving the meaning of his teachings. So Philip says, all right, you know, it's going to be sufficient. It's enough for us if you just show us God. What did Yeshua just said? You know him and you see him now because I'm in your presence. So Philip misses out totally. He says to him, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. Verse 9, and Yeshua says, have you been such a long time? You know, have I been such a long time with you? 
and you do not know me, Philip? What he's saying here in the loudest term, the Gospel of John, is that Yeshua is God. Now, I want to pause because sometimes people listen to a fragment of a message and they, they don't hear the message in context. This is what I want you to say. Many times I speak about the divinity of Messiah. And I've been asked, does that mean that I believe that Yeshua is God? Yes, it is. So they say, so you believe in this oneness doctrine? No, I do not. If you go to our statement of faith, if you go to many messages, I have said over and over, I believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what we see here is that Messiah is simply revealing himself as the Son of God. Is the Son of God less divine than God the Father? No, he's not. In this passage, we read Yeshua saying, and it's almost disappointment in his voice. He says, have I been with you for such a long period and you do not know me, Philip? The one who sees me has seen the Father. So how is it that you say, show to us the Father? They don't get it. And here's the question, do you? Do you truly believe that this one who was born of a virgin, who entered into this world some 2,000 years ago, do you believe that that was God incarnate? The one who was and is and is forever. Let me show you one more important theological truth, and that is this. Many times I've shared this. You need to believe, accept, understand that Yeshua is eternal, not just in the future, but there was never a time that he did not exist. He's the eternal son of God. There was never a moment that Yeshua did not exist in the past. When it says in the beginning, it's speaking about the beginning of revelation that God made known to us. But Yeshua is eternal in the fullest sense of that term. So he says to, to Philip, you know, have I been with you for so long that you don't understand who I am? Now, I want to end with this. If you understand who he is, then your life should reflect that. You don't want to rebel against the truth that God has revealed to you. Well, we're going to close with that until next week when we press on in our study of this 14th chapter and we're going to meet the one who is going to empower us to walk in obedience. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.